The last few weeks, we have been in a message series called Let's Talk. And I love the title of the series because too often in recent years, even before the pandemic, we stopped talking and started posting and texting and email. And we've all had an experience, I'm sure, raise your hand if you've had an experience where someone received a message from you in a way that was not intended. Anybody else? See, there's something beautiful about talking with one another when we can hear tone and see the expressions on one another's face. We can see love or we can hear concern differently than in written forms of communication. And Pastor Bob has been spending these weeks talking about some very important lessons about how we communicate with one another when we talk. The first week of the series, he spoke about the Beatitudes. He talked about how we should be able to speak to one another even when we disagree without being disagreeable. And then he spoke to us about being peacemakers. Peacemakers. People who can speak to others, who can listen, who can care, who can express love even when someone feels differently than we feel. And then last week I especially loved the message about rule keepers. I was the little girl, the granddaughter that uh, Pastor Bob talked about, who used to be the cookie counter in the family. Yes, the cookie counter. My little sister could not get more cookies than I could, but I could have more because I was bigger and growing. So I was a rule keeper, and I have been a rule keeper much of my life. That was an important lesson for me to hear. Well, today we're going to turn in this series to the question of the people to whom we speak. Who do we talk to? Who are we comfortable having conversations with? And what do we need to do to get outside our level of comfort, outside of our bubbles, so to speak, to to speak to people who are different than we are or to whom we would normally not speak? You know, the Gospels... Uh, Many of the Gospels in in the early part tell us wonderful stories of Jesus in ministry among his people, the Jews, in the Galilee area, in Capernaum. And when I had a chance to visit those places, they're beautiful. And Jesus ministered to people who were Jewish like him in those places. But we need to remember that Jesus also left those places to speak to others. And today we're going to use as our central text a story that we find in Matthew 15. But before we go to that story, I'd like to set the stage for you. Because preceding this story, Jesus has an encounter with some Pharisees who are definitely rule keepers. They criticized him because because his disciples did not wash their hands before eating. And Jesus' response to these Jewish leaders, these religious leaders, who were within his bubble, so to speak, was pretty harsh. This is what he had to say. Why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? You nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. That was a tough rebuke to leaders who had the power to harm Jesus, and eventually they would. And after that encounter, Jesus left that area that was filled with Jewish people, and he went to an area where Gentiles lived. This is how Matthew tells the story. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. The area around Tyre and Sidon was filled with people who were Gentiles. Many of them were pagan worshipers. It reminds me of the story when Jesus set his eyes on Jerusalem when he was preparing to go to the cross. Where did he go? He went through Samaria and had an encounter with a different Gentile woman. But I have to tell you, Jesus' response to this woman is one of the hardest 
passages in scripture that I've ever read. The first time I read it, it shocked me. This is a red-letter Bible. Many of you have red-letter Bibles. How many of you have them? A red-letter Bible, for those who don't know, is one where all the words spoken by Jesus are written in red, so we can pay extra attention to them. But the first time I read about Jesus' response to this woman who called him Lord and asked him to heal her daughter, I was dismayed. This wasn't the Jesus who said, let the little children come to me. This wasn't the forgiving Jesus who loved everybody. This is what he said. First, Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. I had trouble with those words the first time I read them. It was not until actually I prepared this sermon that I found a way to reconcile the Jesus that I know, who's forgiven and loved me, with those words. And you can agree or disagree, but I'm going to propose to you that this conversation with this woman, starting out the way it did, but ending the way it did, was designed to teach us about who we should talk to, how we should listen, and how we should be willing to have our minds changed. It was a lesson in open-mindedness. It begins with Jesus ignoring the woman and then acknowledging his first mission was to Israel. But was it really necessary to imply that the woman, the Gentiles, were like dogs? That's hard. So let's focus first on how the Gentile woman responded. Did she respond by sending an angry post? Equally difficult? Equally unkind? No. She knelt down before Jesus and called him Lord. Kneeling before him implies worshiping him. So this Gentile woman, this woman who wasn't a Jew who had already referred to him as son of David, was someone who was a believer despite the fact that she wasn't Jewish. She was an outsider, but she believed. She didn't respond angrily. She responded with humility. Remember the Sermon on the Mount, the first week of this series when Pastor Bob talked about blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the meek? This woman responded that way. There were no harsh words from her. And in response, Jesus taught us how we should talk to people and listen to people who are different with us. He followed those rules that Pastor Bob talked about last week, especially the listen well and the love regardless rules. He demonstrated how to reconsider his position based on the individual rather than the stereotype of the whole group. And he demonstrated that it's not weak to change your mind. It's okay to have your mind changed because Jesus changed his mind saying to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Now we shouldn't be surprised that Jesus changed his mind, who was his example? His father was his example. You remember the story when God was furious the way people were behaving in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he told Abraham that he was going to wipe those cities out, and what followed was an exchange with Abraham that was almost a little bit comical. First, Abraham was very humble, and he said, you know, Lord, I, I'm, I'm only the dust of the earth. I'm, I'm just but dirt and dust. But would you kill the righteous people 
just to punish the wicked? What if there's 50 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah? And God said, okay, if there's 50 righteous people, I won't destroy the cities. But then the conversation went on and repeated itself with Abraham saying, well, what if there's 45? What if there's 40? What if there's 30? What if there's 20? What if there's only 10? And each time God relented and changed his mind. Same thing happened with Moses. When Moses went up on the mountain to be in God's presence and left the people behind, the people got restless. They had Aaron build a false idol for them. He made a golden calf. And God was furious, and he told Moses, I'm going to destroy all those people. And how did Moses respond? First, with great humility, but also as a great leader, saying, if if you're going to wipe them out, I'm the leader, wipe me out first. Blot out my life. And then, kind of appealing to God's larger mission, he said, well, what will all these non-believers, these non-Israelites think if you wipe out these people that you saved from Egypt? It wouldn't, it wouldn't have been saving them at all. You're going to defeat your purpose. So God relented. And there were still consequences. People still died. A plague still happened. But God did not wipe out all the people. So we shouldn't be surprised when Jesus, following in the example of his heavenly father, listened to what this woman said to him and changed his mind. You know, this message today is called Beyond My Bubble. It's not hard to understand the bubble symbol. We all know what bubbles are. My first recollection when I think of a bubble makes me laugh. It was a lesson from my mother who hated when I chewed gum. And I blew a giant bubble, which my mother touched with her finger, and it blew up in my face. It was, in, it was the day we wore the little bangs. My bangs were full of gum. And my mother said, I told you not to blow bubbles. How many of you ever had a bubble blow up in your face like that? Okay, I'm not the only one. Many of us enjoy seeing children chase after bubbles. A picture like the one behind me. You know, we have the soap bubbles, and now they make the bubble blowers this big around. The bubbles are giant, and kids chase them, and they touch the bubbles, and the bubbles burst. But sometimes our human bubbles aren't so easily broken. Can you? Thank you. Here's a bubble. This is more like an adult bubble. It doesn't break so easy. We get inside these bubbles, and they create a boundary between us and other people, a boundary that keeps others out and that keeps us safe and warm inside. Thank you, Felix. The bubbles we make as adults are used to separate. It reminds me when I was growing up in Cleveland, Ohio. Some of the bubbles there were neighborhoods where people lived based on ethnicity. We had little Italy. Little Italy, where my family grew up, my mother, my grandmother, and my aunts and uncles. A mile away was a neighborhood called Huff. That was the neighborhood where black people lived. And there were not unkind names for all these places. There was a suburb of Cleveland that was close in, a working class suburb, Parma. And people used to make jokes about Parma And forgive the expression, this is a quote, this doesn't express my sentiment, but they call the people who live there the Parma Polacks, because the people who live there were from Poland and Eastern Europe. They were bubbles of people who wanted to be only with people who were like them. And we still have bubbles today. Some bubbles start out for a good purpose. We have over 55 communities. I understand why we have them. But I've also read the sad stories sometimes in the newspaper of grandparents who suddenly take responsibility for raising their grandchildren because their son or their daughter was killed in a car accident. And suddenly they're being pressured to leave because the children are obviously not 55. We have neighborhoods in North County that are almost all Republican and neighborhoods in South County that are almost all Democrat. We have neighborhoods where black people live and neighborhoods where only white people live and now we have neighborhoods building where only Latino people live. 
So we do a great job of building walls around ourselves to exclude other people. And we even build those walls in the church. We have traditional bubbles and progressive bubbles. We have bubbles created by race. Sunday morning is often called the most segregated hour in America. We create bubbles based on loving hymns and anthems and other bubbles created based on loving rock and roll music and drums and guitars. We, we create bubbles where the saints are on the inside and the sinners are supposed to stay out until they decide to become saints. I can recall a time in this church not that long ago when someone said to me, oh yes, I think we should love everybody and we should open our doors, but we shouldn't let everybody become members. I don't agree. I don't agree. Any human being who is seeking to know God more who is seeking to understand and love Jesus, should be welcome here in this place and to be a member as well. You know, we have other symbols. On our set, we have windows. These are window frames, and you can see they're clear. You can see through them. You can see light shining through them. But windows aren't always wide open like that. I can remember again, growing up in my big Italian family in Cleveland, we could have Sunday dinner at my house with all my aunts and uncles present in the middle of July when it was very hot and humid out, and my mother would close all the windows because she didn't want the neighbors to hear how loud my uncles were with one another. She closed the windows to keep the noise in. During World War II in Europe, they had blackout curtains. They closed those curtains tight at night. It was for a good reason, so that bombers flying overhead wouldn't see communities based on the light shining out of windows. But what about us? What, when, what about the times when we pull the blackout curtains on the windows of our hearts? That's not what Jesus wanted. In the very first message of this series, Pastor Bob read to us from the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm going to return to the Sermon on the Mount now because there's a passage that talks about windows and light. It's very short, and I'm going to read to you first from the New International Version. This is from Matthew 6 at verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now that doesn't say anything about a window. But if you turn to the message paraphrase instead, which is wonderfully descriptive, this is how those same two verses are written. Your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes wide in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a dank cellar. If you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you will have. With those words we're being reminded that our eyes are supposed to be open to others, that we are supposed to let the light that is within us, that comes in through our eyes, shine out and be welcoming to other people. We're supposed to be able to converse. We're supposed to be able to listen. We're supposed to be able to disagree without being disagreeable. And we do that. How much of what we understand or do we take from another person's meaning and conversation from the expression in their eyes. Once we open our eyes and our bodies and we're filled up with the light of Christ, are we supposed to keep it to ourselves? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Let's go back again to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5. This is what Jesus said. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. 
if I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up to God, this generous Father in heaven. That's it. That's why windows matter. That's why bubbles matter. We aren't given the light of Christ to keep it to ourselves. We aren't given the light to pull the curtains closed. We're given the light to let it shine to other people so that they will come to know what we know about our Lord and our Savior. The passage says, keep an open house. And I love that. Now the symbol that we've been using primarily during this message series is the table. Why the table? Well, the first week Pastor Bob described for us how he and his family used to gather around the table for dinner. We did that too. Every night we waited for my father to get home from work at about 6, 6.30 in the evening, and we always had dinner together as a family. Always. And Sunday dinner included all those Italian aunts and uncles who were loud. How many of you had dinners like that growing up? Lots of us. Well, the table in the church has an even more important meaning. It's a symbol of the sacrament of communion. It's a symbol of how we are to live with one another in the church. Right now, this table doesn't really do a very good job of symbolizing that because there's only one chair, a chair for the insiders. But the Lord's table isn't supposed to be that way. When Pastor Bob ends the communion liturgy, he always ends with these words. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Make us, not make me. Make us one, not make us into many divisions and groups that don't like each other. Make us one with Christ, where Christ, not we, decide who's worthy to come to the table. One with each other. Not just me and Jesus, but me and Jesus and you and our neighbors who we're supposed to love. Make us one with each other and one with Christ. Last week, Pastor Bob used an image I loved. He said, put on your Jesus glasses. So everybody, take a minute, put on your Jesus glasses now, okay? Put on your Jesus glasses. And who do you see at the table with Jesus? I see sinners, like me, and dare I say, like you. I see adulterers. I see Samaritans. I see Roman centurions who were rich, but who asked for healing for their servant. I see lepers and the poor. I see the rich as well. I see children. I see widows. I see men and I see women. I see dense people like Peter, tax guys like Matthew, and dare I say me. I see doubters like Thomas. Those are the people I see at the table when I put on the Jesus glasses. I've been talking about us mostly as individuals, but there are lessons in these symbols for churches as well. We love our stained glass, but one of the things about stained glass is you can't see through it, and people can't see in through it either. Sometimes we pull the blackout curtains closed. We say it's the Lord's table, but do we invite everyone to sit there and talk with us? Nah. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes we enforce rules that keep people out. And I would suggest to you today that this table should be crowded with chairs. Imagine this table filled with chairs. Chairs filled with all kinds of people. So who's not at our table? 
all of the time? Who lives in your neighborhood that you could invite to this table? Next Sunday is Communion Sunday. Is it your neighbor who only speaks broken English, but who might come and listen to a message that's hard to understand if their children could be in children's ministry with Miss Katie? Who else isn't at the table? Is it a single mom who's struggling to make ends meet? Whose kids are a little too unruly for your preferences, but she's doing the best she can? Is it the two ladies who live across the street who happen to be married to each other? Is it the young man who's got tattoos all over his body so you can hardly see his skin and more piercings than make you comfortable? If those people aren't at their table, it's because we don't make them feel welcome. This table should be filled with people who voted for Donald Trump and who voted for Joe Biden. It should be filled with people who are red and yellow, black and white, to quote the words from Jesus loved the little children. This table should be filled with everyone who longs to know Jesus and doesn't. So friends, I invite you today, let's talk, but not just with one another. Let's break our bubbles. Let's throw the windows open wide. Let's fill that table with people who don't know Jesus and who might not look like us. Because if we do that, to quote my dear friend Dr. Morgan, then we are the church 